Great. So while everyone is coming in, I see some uh, some people coming in. Um, we just want to uh, let you know that uh, we have started the recording. And if you don't want to be part of the recording, please turn off your video um, and audio. Uh, stay muted, and uh, you shall not be part of the meeting um, and the recording. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ralph for some introductions. And hey. I'm going to share the agenda. Ralph. Okay, hey, thank you. you. Go ahead. Um, my name is Ralph Wilmer from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Um, and uh, we're going to start off with uh, a welcome from uh, Mayor Kokoris. So let me turn it over to him and then we'll continue with our agenda. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I um, want to thank everybody for joining. You know, this was uh, an area that we chose uh, through this grant uh, to, you know, try to enhance. There's so much opportunity in this area and we want to, you know, through this recovery period, we want to make sure that we can do everything we can to help the businesses. Uh, obviously here in South Ranger Square as, as we're looking at this area, but throughout the entire town. Uh, as far as there's been a number of things we've talked about over the last 15 months, just in general, um, as far as parking and, um, uh, some outdoor seating and things that have happened, but in addition to that, um, we want to just we want to make sure that uh, as as uh, changes happen within within South Pantry Square, we're able to help the businesses uh, bring in uh, new business, and as new businesses come in, help them bring in business to their um, establishment. So South Pantry Square was uh, a great pick because of the fact that we have so many different uh, types of businesses there as well as institutions town hall extends a little bit beyond that but um it's just a it's a beautiful area and you know we're committed uh, to help the business community uh, with anything we can to help enhance uh, their business services and, and help enhance the marketing of those businesses so uh, i appreciate uh mapc and um Ms. Santucci in the planning office for putting this together and look forward as well as the chamber and look forward to uh, working with all of you uh, to come up with some, you know, creative ideas to help um, bring business back to the school, to the square and uh, to enhance the businesses that exist uh, as we move through the final stages of this pandemic. And I just wanted to welcome everyone and and thank them for participating. And I gotta shoot to another meeting, but I wanna thank you very much for giving me a moment to, to introduce myself and, and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So um, we will do introductions. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, my name is Ralph Wilmer. I'm a principal planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. The council is the regional planning agency that uh, works in 101 cities and towns in the greater Boston area. And with me from our uh, planning staff is Sukanya Sharma and Will Dorfman. Um, and they will be participating in the presentation as well. And uh, from Braintree, we have uh, Melissa Santucci Razi, the director of the Department of Planning and Community Development. Uh, Connor Murphy is zoning planner with the department. Lorraine C is the contract administrator and grant writer for the town. Kimberly Roja is the um, representative from the Braintree Chamber of Commerce, who's been working with us on this project. And Meredith uh, Bowrick is the town counselor that represents the South Brain Tree um, area. So um, they've been uh, great help in, in advancing this project. Um, so uh, wanted to get into the project background. We'll also talk about uh, the goals of the project schedule, and then we'll get into some information about the market, the business environment, the physical environment in the square, um, and what the next step will be. And we also, um, We'll save time for uh, Q&A. So 
Um, in terms of the project background, this is a project that has been funded by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, they provide, there was uh, up to $10 million that was allocated to help communities uh, develop plans to promote business recovery and resilience um, in the fallout from uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, we have a very tight time frame for completing the work. We started it in March, and we are to wrap up the project in uh, August. In Braintree, uh, and about a, I should just mention for background sake, about 125 municipalities around the state are participating in this program. Um, the, the area, the study area for Braintree is South Braintree Square, and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail, including uh, showing you a map. Uh, MAPC is what's called the plan facilitator. So we're coordinating the overall effort um, and acting as a consultant for the project. And then we may be working with other entities on specific areas of expertise that they bring um, to the planning process. And the final product will be um, uh, something that we work on with those project partners, including the town, uh, to produce a final plan that's designed to identify some clear goals and strategies and potential funding rec recommendations for um, any of the uh, actions that are uh, uh, recommended in the plan. And uh, by design, the plan is uh, to be sensitive to organizational and staff capacity. Um, at the local level because we want a plan that's achievable and can be implemented in the long term so, or even in the short. So three over, overriding goals uh, for this uh, process and project is to ensure that South Braintree has a data-driven plan to aid in the recovery effort. And um, uh, you'll see uh, several slides that are focused on, on that data um, which uh, hopefully you'll find uh, interesting. Um, another goal of the project is to support the state in the collection and standardization of baseline data to measure COVID-19 impacts. A lot of the work that we're doing is uh, being replicated in all 125 uh, communities. So this is an effort um, that the state is undertaking to really get a handle on what the impacts of COVID have been uh, in terms of economic uh, development um, across the state. And so that includes uh, small communities, suburban communities, and some of our larger cities. And another overarching goal is to uh, promote an equitable recovery. So we want to prioritize the voices and the needs of uh, low income and black, indigenous, and people of color, uh, residents, and business owners part of this process. So in terms of um, some of the issues that we've started to look at uh, here locally is uh, the following. Um, marketing for the square to include social media and marketing, uh, social media promotion and marketing campaigns. Um, streamlining the business application process is something that has come up. Uh, consideration of zoning modifications that can assist businesses in establishing more outdoor space. And that'll become uh, a little bit more uh, urgent for lack of a better term, uh, given the fact that the uh, state emergency order may be expiring sooner than we thought when this whole process uh, started. Um, we're gonna look at establishing design initiatives for physical upgrades to properties that haven't been recently updated. Um, that includes uh, looking at facade improvements um, and, and other uh, um, physical attributes uh, in the business district. Um, and that also includes incorporating streetscape improvements. And by that, we're talking about looking at benches, street furniture, shade trees, bike racks. Uh, it could be as simple as uh, you know, planters and flowers and things along those lines. And finally, to improve utilization of parking spaces and signage, to direct people to parking areas. We've, uh, in the short term, short time that we've been working on it, we've already heard a lot about, uh, about parking. You'll hear more about that. Next slide, please. So 
So in terms of the schedule, uh, we started uh, in March and, and through the early part of May, we were focused on, um, uh, we did a business survey that some of you may have participated in, and we collected a lot of baseline uh, data. Uh, most of the data that we collected were was dictated by um, by the state, and we um, submitted to the state to the, the Department of Housing and Community Development um, our submission of data, um, and that'll be summarized um, in some of the upcoming slides. So you'll see the range of data that we looked at, and then uh, we were uh, to do a uh, an initial public presentation, and here we are. So uh, that is what takes us through May. In May and June, we're focusing on recommendations. So we're gonna continue community, community outreach, and um, we're gonna do consultations with experts. Uh, so for instance, if parking is an issue, we'll look at uh, uh, parking and work with um, consultants who are experts in parking. Um, same with uh, design and zoning related uh, recommendations. And then <clears throat> we'll have a draft report uh, by the end of June that starts to look at some of those recommendations. And then in July and August, we'll be having another public forum uh, to do continued outreach to look at what some of those recommendations are, get some input on those recommendations. And the final plan is due by the end of August. So now I think Sukanya will take us through the first of three polling questions that we have during the presentation. Yes, um, we wanted to hear from you and we wanted to make this a bit more interactive meeting. And so I'll be launching a poll um, and you should see that. You could see it pop up on your screens. Um, and I'll leave that open for some time to see who's on the call uh, and why do you visit South Braintree? Um, it is a multiple choice question, so you can select a lot of options or all of them. Um, but really curious to know who's on the call, how they utilize the area we are trying to work upon. Okay, a lot of responses coming in. I'll give it a few more seconds. Interesting. There are a couple of options in the running which are neck to neck. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and I'm gonna share results. Hopefully this will so we, we, we can see that a lot of uh, our uh, participants today use um, the area as a as for shopping for uh, retail um, uses like hardware, personal care products, food, liquor, et cetera. And a close second is uh, going to restaurants and cafes. Um, great. Um, we also see some uh, salon and professional service or professional offices being utilized in the area by the participants. Great. Um, I'm going to stop the share and hope that works. And then um, I'm going to now talk about a little bit of the diagnostic phase um, and how and the data that we collected as part of it. As Ralph mentioned, uh, a lot of this is going to be uh, sub a lot of this is submitted to DHCD, and we also try to expand the indicators we are looking at to see more within the region. Here you're looking at a map of the LRRP study area that we have selected as a, in conjunction with the town's input. Um, and so getting into the demographic data, it helps us understand the customer base and to understand uh, the customer base uh, between the LRRP um, region or the study area that we had. Uh, we also wanted an intermediate uh, geography between the town of Braintree and the LRRP region, which is why we took one mile radius around that um, around that area that we have with Hancock and Pearl Street as our center. So this gives us a bigger area to sort of look at the immediate custom, customer base. Um, we are looking at um, 9,000 um, people um, for the one mile radius. And then um, that is... Uh, and those people are 
have a little lower, slightly lower median household income and disposable income as compared to the town of Braintree. Uh, we are also looking at a slightly younger demographic um, when it comes to the LRRP with around 42 as a median age uh, as compared to 43 for the town. Um, and the average household size is also smaller. Um, all these are just interesting uh, factors to look at. Um, there's one, interest, one more interesting factor here, which is the uh, retail leakage surplus factor. factor. And here, these numbers um, represent whether there's a leakage um, in that um, in, in the town of whether the retail uh, sales are going outside the town or if it is serving the local population. It seems that these numbers indicate that most of the retail uh, that is being served, that, that is available within the region, not only supports the local shoppers, but is negative, which means that we are attracting shoppers from outside, um, which is interesting to note. Um, that said, all this data is uh, has to be seen in a broader conjunction of the context and not just, uh, it only shows us a part of the picture. Um, here we have some more information about population that might have a broader set of needs. So around 650 households have uh, persons with disability within the one mile radius. Um, and we are looking at around 2% of the population who do not speak English well or at all as reported in the American Community Survey. Um, all these numbers help us understand a little bit more about our region. Um, going into the business environment, uh, we looked at some information, a part of this information was collected during the site visit. Um, and then some of it was collected through MassDOT, um, et cetera, and, and Towns input. Um, we, we counted a total of 75 businesses within our region, um, and uh, two out of those were vacant, those storefronts were vacant. We counted a total of 1,489 uh, parking spots. This includes the on and off street uh, parking. Um, another thing that we looked at was the daily traffic um, numbers. And it seems to have dropped from 2019 to 2020, a general trend overall, given the COVID pandemic. Um, and the bicycle activity and pedestrian activity seems to have increased uh, uh, based on what the numbers we collected from MassDOT. So now I'm going to turn it over to Will Dorfman, our economic development planner, uh, to talk a little bit more about the business survey summary and what we found uh, this business survey was conducted as part of our diagnostic um, phase. So, Will, I'll let you take over. Uh, thanks, Ikanya. Um, so, uh, today we're just going to quickly go over just some of the uh, key highlights that we saw from the uh, business survey that we conducted as part of the diagnostic phase. Um, so, we had about uh, 19 uh, respondents that uh, so Kanye, I think your screen share is, presentation is down. Um, but I can just quickly go over the, uh, go over the key findings from the survey. So we had about 19 responses total uh, within the, uh, within the uh, study area among businesses. Uh, among that 47% uh, of respondents had five or fewer employees. So we had a good chunk of uh, businesses, of, of small businesses uh, participate. Uh, in the survey. Additionally, we also had um, about, so among the top categories for respondents, uh, the largest of which was food service and accommodation accounting for 32% of, uh, of respondents. Uh, tied at 16% uh, included everything related to retail, personal service, and uh, professional and technical services. So we had a good amount of uh, a relatively even spread among uh, attendees or among uh, among respondents, I should say, for the survey. Uh, and among all the respondents, 84% rent their space as well. So uh, a good uh, thanks. So a good amount of um, of uh, respondents are, uh, are are renting their space. Uh, so next slide. So. Uh, Unsurprisingly, unlike so, like many other communities, a uh, uh, large amount of businesses reporting they've been operating at a reduced capacity. So, in this, uh, in the South Brain Tree survey, we had about sixty-three percent of uh, businesses reporting that. Um, however, uh, one thing very unique was that uh, zero businesses reported any sort of closure. So, uh, Brain Tree has been able to the South Brain Tree uh, study area 
has been able to um, relatively weather the, the, the storm of COVID. Um, however, 58% uh, of businesses did report that they generated less revenue in 2020 than they did the year prior. So um, although, uh, it, although it, you, we haven't seen many business closures, many businesses have did, have reported some sort of impact. So over half uh, had less on-site customers uh, on in January, February 2021 than they did prior uh, to the prior to COVID beginning. So a year prior to that, um, vast majority, 94%, uh, reported being impacted by COVID. Uh, the most common of which were uh, having to incur. incur uh, and uh, uh, implement safety measures uh, at the business's expense. Um, and then also many, uh, about 72% reduced operating hours and capacity and in uh, a large amount saw a decline in revenue as well. So um, everyone, a lot of businesses felt, uh, felt a large impact as a result. Um, in terms of overall uh, sentiment with the uh, business environment and the, and the physical environment, um, so 47% of businesses indicated that, our reg that the uh, regulatory environments uh, uh, posed an obstacle to the business operation. And we had cited specific categories. Among the most popular uh, was parking, was cited as a major concern. So 42% of those businesses who had who cited a regulatory concern cited parking. Um, it's a very common thing that uh, we have seen um, throughout our uh, site assessment um, in terms of um, of issues that have been brought up. Um, there's been, uh, however, there's a lot of, uh, most businesses have reported either being satisfied or slightly satisfied with everything related to the condition of public spaces, uh, streets, sidewalks, uh, the safety and comfort of customers and employees, uh, and also the condition of uh, private building storefronts, signs, uh, and the proximity of complementary businesses and uses. So. Uh, overall, a, a largely satisfied uh, uh, base based off of our survey results. Um, so in terms of revitalization strategies uh, that we asked about, 63% of businesses expressed interest in uh, receiving uh, any sort of, of, of a type of assistance. Among the most popular uh, were uh, there were was an interest. There's a large interest uh, in participating in market and shared marketing and advertising. Uh, so better how do we market our business and how do we market uh, coming to the South Brain Tree uh, area? And then another 32% of businesses were interested in uh, low cost financing for things such as storefront and facade improvement as well. Um, among the among all the strategies, the most important, the most uh, popular uh, uh, strategy was to pursue was to pursue the marketing uh, of, of the commercial district. So a lot of interest has been uh, shown in, in terms of how do we market and bring more people to uh, South Braintree. So we have another poll question. Uh, so the next one we want to know is how often do you visit uh, South Braintree? So I will uh, launch the poll right now. All right, thanks, Kai. So we'll leave that open for about a minute, uh, see how, uh, see what we get. We probably close the next five to 10 seconds. I think most people responded. Okay. And we can close out now. So we got a good uh, good mix. Uh, a lot of people are majority either visiting once a day or once a week. So a lot of a lot of a lot of you all are uh, are spending a lot of time in, uh, in South Rain Tree and, uh, and 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 bring a lot there. So good to good to see that. Um, and then, uh, in addition uh, to the business survey, we also uh, MAPC and uh, our partners with the town of Braintree have uh, conducted uh, site sur uh, surveys and observations um, as part of our diagnostic submission to DHCD. Um, while we have certain data requirements that were submitted to, uh, to DHCD, a lot of what we were, a lot of the data that we were able to get on the ground can be can be used to help uh, come up with. Uh, 
uh, as we move towards phase two and phase three, uh, as we implement our uh, final plan. So one of the many strengths that were uh, uh, observed uh, during our site observations were how there's already an existing strong mix of businesses in the district, um, given how the district already has very has has a low vacancy rate and there wasn't really any closures during COVID. Um, this was uh, this was well observed during our or during our visit. Um, signage was also one of the many assets, um, and and, um, and uh, the fact that there is so continued interest in uh, in programs to uh, help improve signage, it can there's a lot to be built on with that as well. Uh, the lighting as well was also uh, a large, uh, high quality um, asset observed throughout. Uh, street banners uh, were consistent. Uh, um, in terms of the challenges, uh, there was minimal outdoor dining, um, and uh, so the fact that um, uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that outdoor dining has been expanded during COVID, uh, that presents an opportunity uh, to for many of the restaurants to be able to expand on that. Uh, wayfinding signage was also uh, was also an issue as well. Um, just having general wayfinding um, towards many of the landmarks, there wasn't, uh, we didn't see uh, as much as we would have liked to see. Additionally, uh, accessibility to the uh, to the MBTA station was another issue um, in terms of pedestrian safety and comfort. Um, while it, there's a decent distance between the station and the South Braintree Square, a lot can be uh, done to uh, address that uh, last mile issue. Um, so these are just some of the uh, key photos and observations that we were able to make during our visits um, in terms of uh, examples of uh, outdoor dining and streetscapes um, to the uh, the upper right corner. Uh, I really like that kind of, that, uh, that, uh, that mural uh, entering into South Braintree Square, although a lot can be done to help uh, improve the pedestrian experience uh, in that area. Um, towards the Southern portion of Hancock Street there, uh, there sits a vacant lot, and I don't have the exact address on me, but that, that's another that's an opportunity site uh, to uh, for potential infill development that can that can very well complement a lot of the existing uses uh, in the in the district. So, uh, a lot of assets and a lot of opportunities that we have uh, we were able to observe during our uh, our visit. So. Question number three, uh, we're, we'd love to know what was the most surprising thing that you, uh, uh, that you uh, learned uh, from the data that we uh, discussed today. So um, we can- Feel free to use the chat to answer mm -hmm. this one. Yeah, this is, this is an open-ended question. So anything that surprised you, shocked you, you know, anything, So um, someone, so Laura Burton said, I believe the empty lot was just approved for an apartment building. Uh, can, I don't know. Okay, so I guess I'm completely behind on my update. So uh, we, so there will be 30 residential units being uh, built on that site. So um, that's a potential to add to the, uh, that's uh, easy, to, easy to add to the customer base for the, uh, for the South Braintree Square right there right in walking distance. So uh, thanks for the, uh, uh, thanks Melissa for uh, um, for showing that. And, and regarding, uh, Angela, your question around uh, the leakage surplus, uh, leakage slash surplus, surplus mm -hmm. factor, um, it's, it's really a number that ranges from minus 100 to plus 100. And it talks about whether the number can indicate whether there is some leakage of retail sales uh, in terms of, uh, if the area is producing enough to just cater to the local public or to people outside the region. So for example, the leakage of retail opportunity outside the trade area uh, would, would be indicated if it is positive. In our case, if it is negative. That means that instead of um, just catering to our local um, customers within the region, the the some of the retail sales can is also catering to people outside who are probably reaching out for some services slash uh, products within the region, according to the data. I hope that answered it in some ways. Thanks, Akanya. That was uh, really uh, interesting to to learn just uh, based off of off of 
you know, where are, you know, the local residents spending their money? Where is business coming from? You know, so it's understanding those can, you know, can help, you know, as we come up with our strategies uh, can play a huge role in understanding what services are available and what, what's, what the potential is there in the market. So I uh, really appreciate uh, that. Um, and we'll be getting into more question answers by the end. Okay. So now I'll turn it back over to Ralph, who will uh, go over the uh, next steps in the uh, in the project. So uh, as I thank you, Will, um, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be a second public forum uh, later this summer. Um, we don't have a date selected for that, but um, we will be uh, publicizing it and, and we can reach out to all of you who attended to uh, make sure that, uh, that you're aware of it. Um, the draft recommendations and uh, final report will be prepared over the next few months. That's, that will be the focus of that next uh, public forum. And then uh, the final plan, as I mentioned, will be um, submitted to the town and to the state uh, by the end of August. So here's just a quick plug. Uh, uh, MAPC is um, uh, reaching the end point of doing our update uh, to our regional plan. We do a regional plan approximately every 10 years. We've been working on it for the last three years. Um, and we have some draft uh, um, policy recommendations, and if you're interested, uh, you can take a look at that um, and, and take the survey at the web address that's on the screen. And we can post that in, in the chat. So before we get into the questions and answers, I'd like to turn it over quickly to uh, Kim Croha, who will talk a little bit about the Braintree Chamber of Commerce, who they are and how they can help. All right. Thank you all. That was that was great. I am, um, you know, I'm really excited, particularly this week for the program to take place with the announcement earlier with the business restrictions and everything starting to feel like it's exciting again, like things are happening, summer is coming and businesses are going to be able to go back a little bit more normal. So my name is Kim Croa. I'm the current chair of the Braintree Chamber of Commerce. I've lived in Braintree about 13 years and I'm an attorney in Quincy at Baker Braverman Barbadoro. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the Braintree Chamber, there's a couple other board members on here tonight, Charlie Defunction, Mike Ford, Sarah Welsh DeMeo. Uh, so we're a, we're a volunteer board. We're working for the business community. Our goal is to be a liaison between the businesses and the town and supporting what's important to the businesses, whether that's networking events, whether that's having a discussion over an issue that businesses are facing and maybe we can try to solve that or at least open the discussion and try to come to some common ground. So you can check us out. Our website is www.braintreechamber.com. We have a Facebook page that we use more often than a LinkedIn page, although we have that also. So I ask you to take a look at those. And we've been working with the town to try to facilitate some information about the program and talk to the businesses. And I'm glad to see that so many of you were able to join us on this beautiful Wednesday evening. So thankful to the, the town who was able to put this grant together and really study the area. You know, I know it's focused on South Braintree Square and, but I think a lot of the recommendations that come out of it are also going to be applicable to other areas of Braintree. So we're looking forward to the next steps in this program. Feel free to reach out to me or anybody else at the chamber with any questions or, or any way that we can help you. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, now we'll turn it over to you for questions uh, that you might have or comments that you wanna make. Uh, there were a couple of questions um, in the chat, which we can start with. So the first one uh, that I see is, uh, where might you add outdoor dining? Um, and uh, yes, the Southside Tavern has expanded, has, has expanded its footprint. Uh, it's my understanding that most of that Outdoor dining is in an area that was parking uh, for the restaurant, and presumably the parking is now in the municipal lot for for the restaurant. But um, what we noticed was generally that the sidewalks were in reasonably good condition, but some of the sidewalks are fairly narrow. So 
it makes it a little difficult to uh, create a lot of outdoor uh, dining in the sidewalk, along the sidewalks. Um, so we'll be looking at a number of different options. Um, and, you know, some communities around the state have, uh, you know, done a few interesting things as well. But one option that, that we can look at is, um, uh, you know, some communities have created parklets uh, on the street uh, that would occupy a parking space or two right outside the restaurant. And they've set up um, a number of tables out there. And there are a number of ways that's been done creatively. You know, you see some that have, um, that are just separated from the street by uh, uh, Jersey barriers. And then there's some that have done some very uh, creative and artful separations between the street and um, the uh, and the sidewalk. Um, then there are some communities that have actually closed off some sections of their business district entirely to traffic and just set up a, a large uh, general area for for dining or just a number of different separate pods. Uh, for different restaurants. So we'll be looking at what the options are. I don't know if Will or Sakanya had something that you'd like to add to that particular question. Okay, if, oh, Melissa, did you wanna say something? Yes, Ralph, thank you. I, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, there is, there has been some interest in outdoor dining and just um, from the municipality side, really trying to balance those needs, balance the parking needs, and then also balancing um, the traffic volumes that go through those areas um, so that we don't really have competing interests where one of those um, situations is kind of struggling while the others are advancing. So um, it's, it's an interesting challenge. Um, you know, everyone likes to dine out and then we hear from a lot of the businesses that they need the parking. So in an area that is very automobile dependent, you know, how do we get creative to sort of balance um, those competing goals so that the different types of businesses all advance equally as we as we move through this process? Yeah, and, and certainly any input that uh, you know any of the business owners would like to um, provide um, would be uh, would be helpful. And you know, sort of as a good segue to that, there. There are a couple of comments about um, uh, parking. Um, so yeah, the 1400 spaces does sound like a lot. There was a, a parking study that was done in the area uh, a couple of years ago. So the numbers come off of that and I believe it includes both public and uh, private uh, spaces. So some spaces like either at churches or, or, or other private properties um, you know, may not be available to the general public. Then there are other private spaces like for Walgreens or uh, CVS. And then there are, um, you know, there's the municipal lot, uh, which has some parking. Um, and then it also includes the street spaces. I don't remember, uh, Will, maybe you know if, the, uh, if that number includes some of the spaces as far uh, uh, off the... Um, street as um, like town hall? I believe so. So I think yeah. it so, so includes, so as you mentioned, includes public and private the owned spaces on street and uh, off street parking as well. So when I mean, you look at everything available in the study area combined, uh, uh, it all, I guess, slowly adds up. And yeah, there are strategies, just... go ahead. Go ahead. I was just mentioning in terms of numbers, we also included, so uh, municipal employees and guests had around 160 parking spaces out of the 1,400 and some open 3R, no overnight parking spaces were around 70 uh, based on our estimates. Um, and then there were some resident only, uh, some unregulated street parking, which was around uh, 250, 250 spaces, that's a bigger one. Um, and then we have some regulated street parking in the order of around 90 spaces. And yes, for mostly uh, employee only or uh, private parking for church or for businesses, some sort. And then um, there are 
strategies that other communities have used to try and encourage uh, shared parking so that spaces that might only be available uh, for private use during certain hours or certain days um, that they may be made available for um, uh, parking on a, on a broader basis during the week. And that may, you know, if we decide, if there's an effort to try and uh, use some parking spaces for outdoor dining, for instance, and those spaces be easily replaced by other nearby spaces that might be available on private properties that don't need them in, in the evening, for instance. Um, there's another comment slash question about changing traffic to one way to uh, potentially accommodate outdoor seating. Um, that's what uh, is being done in Belmont Center. Um, Leonard Street, which is a uh, robust uh, downtown area, um, they have, and they do have a fair number of restaurants and cafes, so they have um, eliminated the parking spaces on both sides of the street uh, to some extent, not entirely, um, at least where the restaurants are. And because that space um, took up uh, both travel lanes, they changed it to uh, one-way traffic for now. Looks like two other questions that came my way that sort of have to do with traffic and parking. Uh, one of them was whether there's any ideas for rerouting or redirecting traffic to encourage drivers to use a, a different route, maybe going by the T station or if there's some other possibility. And then sort of sort of a different question, but goes to the same issue, whether it's possible to limit the amount of time that people can use the parking spaces to even less than two hours to try to open those up a little bit more frequently. So um, I can I can jump in, um, Ralph, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, and there is um, these are very interesting questions because I'm sure everyone's sitting here going, "Where are the 1,400 parking spaces?" Um, we did have a study done a few years back from Nelson um, Nelgard, and um, we shared that with Ralph, and, and that material uh, was incorporated into the study area. Um, I think most of the people that utilize the square and Hancock Street have seen. Uh, Mecca Chorus has gotten, um, you know, sort of ahead of the parking situation and, and started to stripe um, a lot of the areas, I would say, um, along Hancock. Uh, a lot of that striping, I would say, was done within the last year. Um, and recently, um, he has discussed with me um, through initiatives with the DPW um, that they're going to do um, some more striping. You know, I don't know about you folks, but when you see an area where five cars would fit, but three people are parked just um, with a lot of space in between, it's, it's you know, somebody who um, owns a business along there, that, that can be very frustrating to them seeing an opportunity. You might see somebody kind of slow down and try to get in, but they can't and, you know, and then they take off and there's a sale or a customer or a coffee or a sandwich or whatever it is that they were going to purchase. Um, and in addition to that and to the striping, um, we're looking very closely at putting uh, 15, 30 minute, those type of time limits on um, uh, some of the areas where it's more of a quick type of purchase. Um, so if somebody runs into the hardware store, somebody wants to grab a coffee and really trying to encourage those spaces um, right in the, in the prime of the square available for sort of those quick types of things. If you're going into Bruce Fisher's and I don't want to call them out, but, or if you're going into any of those salons and you're, you're going to come out looking like a completely different person because you've been in there for so long, you know, use the municipal lot or, you know, park a block or two over, especially in this type of weather and walk over. So we're really trying to um, encourage, and a lot of communities has, have been successful in sort of zoning that parking. Um, you know, Braintree doesn't use meters. I know there's a lot of people that um, aren't in favor of meters, but meters uh, at times can help with incentivizing um, the better spaces cost a little bit more and then you sort of work out in centric rings. Um, we're not looking at meters at this point. I don't think there's any, any move to that, but really trying to get creative um, so that people that are just doing that quick stop can pull over for four or five minutes, do what they need to do 
um, and be on their way and that space opens up for the next person. Um, so that is something that we're talking about um, at town hall um, and hope to be able to accomplish uh, in the near future. I see a great suggestion in the chat from uh, Anne. Uh, definitely something we can think about when we are looking at the recommendations. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah thank you. There, there are a lot of great examples out there of, of, of uh, uh, activating uh, streets uh, for pedestrian use. So uh, we'll definitely uh, uh, look at that when we go into the recommendation phase. So thank you. One other question that came my way, um, the zoning in the area, obviously Braintree is looking at an overall zone, but whether there's a potential before that process plays through of taking a look at the commercial zoning regulations and some of the things that affect the existing businesses and, and the couple of vacant spaces there to try to make a little bit more flexibility. Um. Thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat. Is there a plan to make any changes such as outdoor seating once the governor list, lifts the emergency order on June 15th? Um, it's my understanding that uh, the legislature is looking at options to either e extend some of the provisions of the emergency order, at least through this year or maybe beyond, um, to uh, more easily accommodate um, outdoor dining, to look at uh, ways in which, you know, even uh, the whole, uh, the part of the order that relates to um, uh, to-go cocktails and, and things along those lines. Um, I think that if the legislature, I get my impression is that if the legislature does not act or does not act on time, then a lot of those policies will have to be addressed at the local level. So, you know, I think the municipalities can extend some of these things if the state legislature does not act uh, in a timely manner. But I know that there's a lot of behind the scenes negotiations um, on trying to extend these things and to make these accommodations to businesses uh, go beyond the extent of the emergency order. And obviously that'll play into whatever recommendations we make. Uh, um, you know, our report will be coming out a couple of months after the emergency order expires. So I think we'll have a better picture at least as to where things stand and we can reflect that in our uh, recommendation. Are there any other comments or questions people might have? One last one I forgot came to me. Uh, whether we could look at the traffic light, uh, the study of the signal by the T to clear up some of the congestion that backs up there, whether that's an area to be that we can study. Yeah, we can we can look at that to see whether or not um, you know that's a logical next step. Is it just to clarify on Ivory Street, Kim? Right. Um, okay. I think so. That's the one in between the transfer station and the T. Is there anything else that uh, people would like to add or ask about? All these questions are really helpful for us to think about uh, recommendation stage and what we should look at. So please keep them coming if you have any other questions, concerns, comments. And we have also dropped our emails in the chat. We can drop it again, but feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're always open to know more about concerns from business owners, residents, et cetera. And both uh, Melissa's and my email, <coughs> excuse me, addresses are in the uh, announcement, the flyer that was uh, used to publicize this.
Yeah, thank you, Ralph. I think it's really important um, that people, um, if they didn't have an opportunity to do the survey uh, and that if they have some concerns or some questions, um, we really are really interested in understanding the needs and sort of, of all the variety of businesses I had mentioned earlier um, to really try to evaluate. Uh, we don't want to um, make suggestions and recommendations. It's really trying to um, advance the, a variety of businesses uh, and their needs and their goals to sort of create uh, an environment where, where everybody can, can really thrive. Uh, my email is here. Uh, my information is also um, on the town website. I'm available uh, by phone as well. If somebody would like to uh, have a conversation, uh, I welcome any input. If anyone's here this evening um, that is aware of some other businesses um, that haven't had a chance to, to provide any input, uh, we really welcome people. Uh, you can reach out to me directly um, or you can reach out to Ralph, him uh, and his partners at MAPC are really um, this partnership is, we're very lucky to have uh, their expertise um, and their ability to tap into these subject matter experts um, as we move through this phase uh, and also in conjunction um, with Kim and, and her partnership um, with the Braintree Chamber. It's really, really important for us to, um, to collect uh, public input. It's something that we struggle with from time to time, um, but we really wanna hear from people. So please, um, any method, that's available to you, um, you know, please take advantage of that. Um, my office is in town hall. I'm, I'm there quite a bit. So the chances are you'll find me. Um, if you're in the area and you'd like to stop by, uh, we also welcome that as well. We're open to the public uh, and we have meeting rooms where we can have uh, discussions uh, safely, uh, social distanced as well. So any way that uh, works for uh, businesses and residents uh, works for us uh, in this group here as well. Thank you. Very good. Well, thank you all for coming and participating. Uh, this was very helpful. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you on this and continue to reach out. And um, I guess we'll be able to adjourn a little earlier than advertised, which usually doesn't. Yes. <laughs> usually and doesn't. Yeah, and we have have too many opponents. <laughs> and we hope and again, to see you for the second one. Yeah, and yes. again, thank you. Thank you to uh, MAPC and, and Kim and the chamber again, uh, and, and the Braintree staff, Connor, um, Murphy, uh, and, and the planning department, and Lorraine C. Um, and, and also, uh, we've had some help from some interns at Town Hall. This has really been a very collaborative effort. Uh, and Councilor uh, Barico, she couldn't make it here this evening. She had a previous commitment, but um, I want to thank her for literally hitting the streets and engaging with the businesses um, to really try to get uh, as most information as we can. So the partnership is great. And uh, just on, on behalf of the town of Braintree, I want to thank everybody for attending this evening. Uh, and please uh, take advantage of an opportunity to reach out if you have additional commentary or questions. And please um, share this information with your neighbors, friends, um, and, and businesses in the square um, that may, may not be represented here this evening. Um, but we, we would love to you know, continue to collect information and, and would love help to get the word out from, from anyone here this evening um, that has some connections that we might not have. So thank you everyone very much. And the presentation will be uh, made available as well. Yep, yep, we'll have that up um, on the town website. Uh, so that people can take a look uh, or print that or uh, direct anybody that didn't have an opportunity um, this evening to attend. Uh, I, we will also be um, discussing um, with BCAM um, an opportunity to potentially um, air this um, as well so people can uh, catch it at home um, if, if they're not watching <laughs> something else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. We're just we're very grateful to have this partnership and um, the opportunity to help these small businesses is, is something that we really, really look forward to. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you, everyone.